world of diverse environments populated by organisms large and small, each adapted to its surroundings and to its neighbors in ways that allow it to survive. The question is, how did this complex living system, our biosphere, develop over the 4.6 billion years of Earth's history? One way to think about this question is to travel backwards down life's timeline, back through the time when plants and animals colonized the land, back when the early lines of animal life were first evolving, back through a long period when free living cells were diversifying, and through an even longer stretch when tiny bacteria-like organisms ruled the world, and then no life at all. Imagine a chemical soup containing the precursors of molecules that could replicate. At some point, these replicating units became associated with membranes. They were becoming protocells. Picture a brutally efficient selection process in which various kinds of protocells compete for raw materials in the soup. The best performers survived. These were cells that used DNA to pass on their genetic program. And one of them became the ancestor of all things living today. To find living representatives of these early cells, Look in places that might be similar to the conditions under which they first evolved. A hot spring is such an environment, low in oxygen, rich in dissolved minerals, high in temperature. Adhering to the rocks in the near boiling water are tiny organisms that, under the microscope, look like bacteria. But their cell membranes and ribosomes, the small bodies where proteins are manufactured, have a different chemistry than bacteria or any other form of life. In the 1990s, Evolutionary biologists began classifying organisms with these features into a new domain called archaea, a word derived from the Greek word for ancient. Living where nothing else can, archaeans are truly life's extremists. Bacteria are familiar microbes. They spoil food, make us sick and break down virtually every bit of organic material that comes into being. Like archaea, bacteria are prokaryotes, cells without nuclei. In fact, bacteria anatomy couldn't be simpler. A cell wall surrounding an outer membrane containing a single long DNA molecule that sequences a few thousand genes. Bacterial cytoplasm is loaded with ribosomes, the molecular machines that build proteins, the enzymes that bacteria pump into their surroundings in order to digest organic material. Many have flagella, tiny whips driven by ATP-fueled motors. Flagellar-driven locomotion allows bacteria to seek out and remain near their food source virtually any form of dead organic material. Bacteria locomotion is often directed by chemical gradients. The bubble is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide released by decomposer bacteria is a good indicator of organic food. So swimming up a CO2 gradient is likely to bring a bacterium into an even richer soup of building block molecules. These spiral-shaped bacteria are digesting a paramecium carcass. Although a backward twist may carry them away, they quickly reverse their flagellar motors and move back to the food source. Competition for nutrients among the various kinds of bacteria is severe, and many species have developed a kind of chemical warfare, releasing antibiotics that kill off the competition or at least retard its reproduction. 
The overall effect of this incessant activity is that the molecules of life are constantly being recycled. Without this return of materials from dead organisms to the living world, the complex life of planet Earth could never have come into existence. The earliest evidence of bacteria comes from rocks dated at 3.5 billion years, these layered fossils. The fossil layers resemble the mats of bacteria that form along the edges of highly mineralized warm springs. These scenes may be as close as we can come to visualizing what the living world of 3.5 billion years ago was like. At least two lines of organisms were flourishing, the ancestors of today's archaea and the ancestors of today's bacteria. The layered fossils from these ancient rocks were produced by early forms of filamentous microbes that resemble cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria contain chlorophyll, a molecule that traps light and converts it into chemical energy and ultimately into food molecules through the reactions of photosynthesis. Like today's plants, these early cells split water, H2O, obtaining hydrogen ions that drive the reactions of photosynthesis while releasing oxygen as a waste product. As this new gas accumulated, it must have created a biological catastrophe in communities of organisms that had evolved for close to a billion years in the total absence of oxygen. However, as oxygen built up, certain bacteria evolved ways of using it to get more energy from food molecules. These aerobic bacteria took over while anaerobes were restricted to living deep in the mud, the same oxygen depleted environment where they are found today. Now jump back to when the two great domains, archaea and bacteria, branched out from the earliest cells near the dawn of life. In these microbes, the DNA is distributed around the cell as one long molecule. Their shape is determined by their relatively inflexible outer wall, a protective envelope that was, no doubt, a requirement for life in the extreme environments of early Earth. But a cell confined by a rigid wall cannot take advantage of one of the most abundant food sources available, other cells. To capture and engulf cells for food requires a naked cell with a flexible outer membrane, something like this small amoeba. Living in the protection provided by layers of cyanobacteria, Wallless mutants began experimenting at becoming predators. This change from bacteria-style external digestion to internal digestion required new equipment, such as special containers for digestive enzymes, places for internal digestion to occur, and ways to expel wastes. Internalizing these disruptive chemical processes put the cell's DNA at risk. An evolutionary response to these hazards is easily imagined. The predator's DNA became associated with a protective membrane, eventually forming an envelope around the DNA. Organisms carrying this structure, a nucleus, gave rise to the third domain of life, the Eukara. Watching primitive nucleated cells collected from the muddy bottom of a pond, one can imagine the living world that existed at the beginning of the Eukara line sometime around three billion years ago. Mitochondria swarm by the thousands in virtually all nucleated cells, plant, animal, or protozoan. They use oxygen to break down food molecules, 
producing a eukaryotic cell's working supply of ATP. A mitochondrion is made up of a double membrane, with the inner membrane folded, increasing its surface area for carrying out the reactions that produce ATP. One of the great surprises of modern biology is that these vital organelles originated from aerobic symbionts, bacteria. Why do biologists think so? Mitochondria contain DNA, and their DNA is of the bacterial type, not the type found in nucleated cells or archaeans. This electron micrograph captured mitochondria in the act of reproducing. They look very much like bacteria undergoing fission. And that double membrane, which is most easily explained by an engulfment process. One more piece of evidence. Although virtually all nucleated cells contain mitochondria, there is one fascinating exception. Pelomyxa, a rare, very large, and very active amoeba, contains none. Instead, its cytoplasm is filled with thousands of symbiotic bacteria that carry out aerobic respiration, sharing the ATP produced with their host. Pelomyxa is a living model for the kind of symbiotic association thought to have produced mitochondria. By analyzing the genetic material from today's cells, biologists are beginning to understand the ancient ancestry of living things. We can now look back and see three branches that produce today's millions of species, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, the three domains of life.